level before, we're going to fly above the forest. So if you have questions about how to distinguish various cryptocurrencies in what line on the balance of payments thing, you should ask somebody other than me, uh, uh, Tobias or Klaus Knott. Um, Tobias, as you all know, is the financial counselor and director of the Monetary and Capital Department at the IMF. Before that, he was at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. And Klaus Knott has been president of the uh, Dutch Central Bank for now uh, over a dozen years, or about, a, yeah, over a dozen years. Uh, and he's chair of the Financial Stability Board. Uh, before that, he was with the Dutch Finance Ministry, and apparently, at times when the government wouldn't hire him, he would do stints at the IMF. So welcome back. Um, uh, Klaus is obviously remote. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, Tobias and Cloud are going to make some inter opening presentations. I'll ask them some questions. And then uh, we invite you to participate. Can't remember who we agreed was going first, but do you have a preference? I think Klaus was going to go first, but Klaas. I don't see him on. There he is. Oh, there he is. All right. Klaus, welcome. I would be ready to go first if you were ready for me. We're ready for you. Good. Well, thank you, David, and uh, good to see you, and also good to see you, Tobias, uh, uh, even though uh, I'm a little bit uh, remote. But thanks for having me, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to participate in this manner. So um, I begin by observing that since uh, the mining of the first Bitcoin block in 2009, uh, crypto asset markets have shown a remarkable evolution from a niche experiment to a complex and interconnected financial ecosystem. And this rapid expansion prompted the FSB to start monitoring crypto's systemic implications from 2018 onwards. Quite soon after that, it became clear that not all that glitters is gold in the crypto world. While decentralized ledger technologies continue to hold the promise of serious societal benefits, some of the use cases that we've seen were just outright fraudulent. And this underlies the crucial role already played by data in any policy response to crypto, because only reliable data will allow us to accurately separate the wheat from the chaff. Now, let me kick off today's discussion by debunking three common misconceptions about crypto assets and by laying out a clear path I see towards responsible innovation. So let me begin by the first misconception, and that's about stable coins. Stable coins are a specific type of crypto assets that purport to hold a stable value towards fiat currency or a pool of assets. Well, not only are stable coins not really coins, they also have not been very stable, to put it mildly. If improperly regulated stable coins become more widely adopted, they could rapidly become relevant for global financial stability, given their money-like nature. Recent announcements have underscored that interest in these assets has not abated, and the FSB will therefore monitor these developments closely. Second, Many crypto proponents claim that blockchain offers an immutable and transparent record which regulators can then use to continuously supervise these activities. But that is not entirely accurate either. Many activities occur off-chain, and certain information that regula regulators require is not disclosed at all by the blockchain. And finally, and this debunking may hurt the most for the true believers here, crypto is not as decentralized as is often proclaimed. Economic forces have objectively led to the emergence of highly centralized crypto service providers. And these entities have become essential for the functioning of the crypto market. For some, the failures of prominent service providers have underscored the need for more decentralization in crypto rather than less. They believe that financial services can be disintermediated through the inception of decentralized finance, often abbreviated as DeFi. However, on-chain analysis has shown that governance tokens, which are used to vote on fundamental governance changes to the DeFi protocol, that they are in practice only held by a very small group of people. So how decentralized is that? 
So it is clear that not everything in crypto is what it initially seems to be. And this is also true if you look at the economic functions of crypto activities, with, which clearly replicate traditional finance. Think, for instance, of the underlying similarities between staking and the century-old practice of deposit-taking. But unlike traditional financial activities, crypto asset activities are not globally subjected to comprehensive regulation. And where relevant standards are applicable, they are not always consistently applied. And that's problematic, considering crypto's borderless nature. These regulatory inconsistencies, combined with the rapid pace of development, led the FSB to conclude in 2022 that crypto assets could soon start to pose a threat to the global financial system. And to address the financial stability risks of these activities, we delivered a global regulatory framework with policy recommendations to authorities. This framework is based on the well-known same activity, same risk, same rule principle. It's now up to national authorities to implement these recommendations. We aim to complete a review of their progress by end 2025. The FSB recognizes that the emergence of crypto assets has also brought a broader set of societal issues to the fore. Financial stability risks may, for example, be aggravated through growing currency substitution by crypto assets. At the request of the Indian G20 presidency, the FSB and the IMF have worked together to further understand how crypto's macroeconomic and financial stability risks interact and how they reinforce each other. In our final report, we syn synthesize our recommendations to address both types of risks. The path forward sketched by this synthesis report is clear. We need to regulate crypto asset activities comprehensively and in line with the well-known same activity, same risk, same rule principle. Only then can financial stability risk and monetary stability risks be effectively addressed. And given the rapid speed of market developments, there is absolutely no time to dilly-dally. These recommendations need to be implemented as soon as possible. Now, as we are at a statistical forum here today, this is actually a good place to emphasize the importance of data. Having access to accurate and reliable data is needed to navigate crypto's complex waters. Having the right data is crucial if we want to identify all material stability risks, especially in a market that evolves so rapidly. And only the right data will help us see what happens below DAC or below chain. Access to reliable data will become even more relevant once we start implementing the FSB's regulatory framework. The resulting toughening of requirements may incentivize crypto service providers to relocate abroad. Where will the crypto ships sail when some crypto ports become less welcoming? Our framework seems to address this question, seeks to address this question in part by requiring crypto services providers to reliably disclose and report financial data. Only then can we see if certain service providers do not just try to evade regulation by setting up shop in remote places. Only then can we see if DeFi is not just used to avoid having to comply with robust governance requirements. The sooner we implement these recommendations, the sooner we get all we get this all too valuable data. And this is, of course, where we will have to rely on the hard work of many of you here today. Statisticians have an essential role to play in collecting the data, integrating the new data into existing databases and coming up with new statistical indicators that are able to provide meaningful and timely insights into the crypto ecosystem. The path that I have charted earlier will also require close cooperation at the global level. And one particularly urgent issue here is the considerable risks crypto assets pose to emerging markets and developing economies, or EMDEs in short. We already see that crypto assets are more widely used in EMDEs. In part, 
this may be because of the weaker domestic macroeconomic frameworks, leading, for example, to currency substitution by stable coins. It's crucial that local authorities are able to understand the size of these risks. In 2024, the FSB will therefore work to improve ways to practically enhance information sharing between EMDEs and advanced economies. In the context of crypto's borderless nature, we also need to build institutional capacity to effectively regulate crypto beyond our membership. At first, we will focus on positive incentives to promote global adoption, such as outreach and technical workshops. And that is why it is crucial that the FSB works closely together with the IMF, with its great resources and knowledge in this domain and its near global membership. In this context, let me also note the importance of the IMF's ongoing work on addressing data gaps, such as via, via the third edition of the G20 Data Gaps Initiative. The question remains whether this focus on positive incentives will be enough in the long run. If we observe that certain crypto providers continue to evade regulation by offering their services from jurisdictions with weaker standards, we may need to take extra steps, such as by asking traditional financial institutions to take extra precautions when dealing with such providers. As said, I think the path forward is clear. But if you want to know even more about it, I would recommend you consult our roadmap, which outlines the steps we will take to ensure effective, flexible, and coordinated implementation of the FSB and IMF's policy frameworks. Policy frameworks, which taken together, seek to build institutional capacity beyond G20 jurisdictions, enhance global coordination, cooperation, and information sharing, and address data gaps necessary to understand the rapidly changing crypto asset ecosystem. Dear colleagues, the path forward is charted. Now let's start walking it together. And for here, let me stop now and give the back floor to you, David. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So Klaus is going to leave the screen, I understand, but he'll be back when we get to the conversation. Tobias. All right. So uh, thanks so much for having uh, me here, uh, Bert, uh, for uh, organizing this um, fascinating uh, forum. Um, I was with uh, class in, in Basel uh, just earlier this week at an FSB uh, meeting. Um, and I just want to start by underlining that the FSB and the IMF is working extremely closely together on uh, financial sector policy issues. And Klaas already mentioned that uh, we deliver to the G20 a, what, what is called a synthesis paper, so, which is putting together the regulatory approach, which is really the FSB's domain, uh, together with more macro-financial considerations for policies towards crypto assets. So I want to talk about that a little bit and then get to the statistical um, and data issues uh, as a result of, of that discussion. So. Um, so this synthesis paper uh, followed an earlier paper that uh, we did here uh, at the IMF to, to the board. So this is our official uh, uh, policy uh, approach. And that earlier paper had three uh, aspects. Um, so the first one was a robust macro policy foundation uh, to ensure stability relative to crypto assets. Uh, the second one is to ensure uh, the legal treatment and comprehensive regulations. Uh, so I just want to emphasize that uh, it's not only the regulation, it's also legal aspects that are extremely important. So for example, what tokenization means from a legal perspective is vastly different across countries. Um, and thirdly, the paper emphasized uh, the need for coordination and so uh, the IMF, of course, uh, is, is uh, all about coordination. We have 190 members and we have a very strong governance within the institution in order to achieve this uh, coordination. And we have many tools such as technical assistance, but also surveillance that help us to achieve coordination. 
Um, but um, uh, of course, we also work very closely with the FSB uh, on the regulatory aspects. Um, in particular, we are assessing uh, regulations. Um, so the regulations that are formulated by the FSB are being assessed by us through our financial sector assessments. And we are providing uh, technical assistance to countries to help uh, develop regulatory approaches. Uh, so in particular for crypto assets, we have already seen quite a bit of demand in terms of getting help uh, uh, to develop uh, regulatory frameworks. Now, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking more about the, the macro aspect that is complementing the regulatory aspects. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the first uh, challenge here is that crypto assets can undermine monetary sovereignty, right? Because basically, uh, monetary policy is based on the idea that central banks can control um, the amount of money uh, in an economy, right, via open market operations and interest rate policy. Um, and of course, if uh, crypto assets that are not controlled by the monetary authority become a substantial fraction uh, of transactions in a country, that is undermining the ability uh, of a central bank to, uh, to uh, control uh, monetary uh, 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 policy. Uh, so it's, it's quite similar to uh, dollarization, which is a phenomenon we have known for, for, for many uh, decades, right? So uh, we have many dollarized uh, economies that pose a significant challenge uh, to uh, monetary policy. And so uh, 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 about two years ago, uh, we coined uh, uh, the term cryptoization uh, as an analog uh, to dollarization. Um, and so, you know, that is one particular challenge uh, for monetary policy. A second challenge is in terms of uh, uh, capital controls, right? So the vast majority of countries do have capital controls, right? Um, you know, not, not a country like the US or, or, or advanced economies uh, in Europe. But most emerging markets, over 100 countries around the world, have capital controls. And it is uh, so like, you know, the only way for those countries to, that oftentimes have weak institutional setups, in particular weak monetary credibility, weak enforcement, it's the only way to um, sort of contain uh, the flight of capital, right? And of course, crypto assets are one of the primary tools to get um, a, a, a capital out of, of a country. So some countries have, you know, prohibited uh, crypto entirely. Um, and oftentimes uh, uh, the motivation was this uh, uh, capital control uh, aspect. Um, and finally, of course, uh, we can see financial stability risks, right? So, um, you know, we have seen, you know, collapses of uh, so-called stable coins, as, as Klaas pointed out already, most stable coins are not stable, um, and some have collapsed in a, in a dramatic fashion. Um, and, you know, at the moment, this is all like a very, you know, a, a segment that is not very interconnected with the rest of the financial system, but that could change at some point. Uh, and so it could potentially pose uh, systemic threats. And so, you know, in terms of policies, <laughs> what we're doing next year is to work together with the FSB to roll out the regulatory uh, agenda, but also rolling out um, this more macro-focused and macro-financial agenda, uh, which includes these monetary policy and capital flow measures, but which also includes fiscal uh, measures. Because, of course, for fiscal policy, crypto assets also uh, uh, represent a major challenge. Uh, and then the legal issues uh, we can we can go into and and and, and anti money laundering and, and criminal activity more broadly. These are these are additionally you know l potentially large and and quantitatively challenging uh, uh, things. Um, so um, basically, you know all of you know all of this, all of this crypto is potentially. Uh, macrocritical, and I think for some countries it's already macrocritical. So, in some countries, we see 
a macroeconomically large amount of transactions in, in crypto assets. And this is where BERT comes in. So, um, so um, you know, the G20 has given um, uh, uh, the fund a mandate, um, uh, particularly <laughs> uh, recommendation 11 of the uh, G20 Data Gaps Initiative, to think about, uh, you know, collecting data on digital money. Now, you know, there is this uh, nomenclature uh, challenge that, you know, we don't think of crypto assets as they exist today as money, but they're broadly so like referred to as digital money. So there's a there's a funny uh, tension here, but um, they are quantitatively large for some countries. They could become quantitatively larger for other countries, and crypto assets could become money at some point, right? So in particular, uh, some jurisdictions, including the UK uh, recently, uh, are thinking about allowing uh, uh, specifically regulated stable coins to hold their reserves in high-powered money, i.e. to have access to central bank reserves. And at that point, this is something that we here at the IMF called synthetic CBDC, because it's sort of like, you know, it, it's like a CBDC, but it's it's not issued by the by the by the central bank, but it does hold its reserves uh, in in central bank money. Um, you know that could emerge at some point. Um, in the U.S., uh, there have been a number of crypto issuers that have tried to get licenses from the Federal Reserve that would allow them to uh, hold their backing in 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 high powered money, and that was rejected so far. But you know things could potentially change. So the punchline is, and I, I will be done. Sorry, I'm I'm uh, somewhat long winded here. But uh, the punchline is that um, you know capturing the magnitudes of these developments is extremely important um, to develop policy frameworks because we need to know what we're talking about, right? Um, uh, and you know, even though it's not money yet, it could become money. And even if it's not money, we still need to measure it. Um, but it's extremely challenging. And, and Klaas already alluded to that. And, and uh, I think the previous panel talked about that, right? I mean, when you think about Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin has no location, right? It's an algorithm in cyberspace. Uh, it has been alive for 15 years now. Um, and you know it, it's it's not associated with any legal entity, right? Um, now the regulatory approach is really to uh, regulate the entry points to crypto assets, but uh, some of these crypto assets are so like countryless. Um, that I think is one challenge. The second challenge is that even when there is an entity that is an issuer such as for some stable coins, right? So stable coins have to have a backing. So there has to be an entity that does something. That entity may also not have a legal uh, uh, location. So some stable coins are issued and, and, and there's no legal <laughs> jurisdiction. Uh, and uh, so that is a tremendous challenge, right? Because um, you know, we can't like call a statistical office in some country because you know this just exists uh, in uh, in cyberspace. So, so, but it's still important to capture. So, so that is a, a, a tremendous challenge, but uh, it is it is very important to tackle it. So, can I uh, start with sort of a little bit of a skeptical question at the beginning, class? I hope you can join us again. So, you, uh, you use the word "could potentially" a lot. And I understand uh, we know that things tend to start small and grow rapidly, and sometimes they go away, and sometimes they don't. Um, the, the sense I get is that uh, the IMF and the FSB think that we are headed towards a world where these assets, these digital assets, are going to be a much more important part of the financial system. Maybe Bitcoin was a bubble and it goes away, but stable coins or CBDCs, or I learned something now, synthetic CBDCs. I can't wait till we get the synthetic derivative CBDCs. Um, that you are acting as if we're at the beginning of something and 10 years from now, this will be a really, really important part of our financial system. Do you believe that? Klaas? 
Well, I'm not so sure. I mean, I would say uh, that in a way we are uh, trying to uphold the principle of technology neutrality. Um, it is not, uh, we, we are not in the business of trying to pick uh, winners here. Uh, we are not in the business uh, uh, of, of trying to prescribe certain solutions or stimulate certain solutions to, uh, to certain problems. I think what we are uh, trying to aim at is, is look at what is the economic function that is being fulfilled here. And then, of course, uh, what are the associated risks? by uh, fulfilling this uh, function and then of course particularly focusing on the on the financial stability risks that uh, that they are well managed here but for instance uh, where stable coins uh, enter into the area of payments we still have also the world of traditional payments and it's not uh, at all that we've given up on the world of traditional payments we have <laughs> noticed that in cross border payments there are serious problems serious challenges and and maybe you could argue uh, that us having been a, a little bit late to the game in trying to overcome these challenges mm. that may have been one of the root causes why uh, this crypto asset space has developed uh, so quickly but we have as a uh, as a consequence of that we've also laid out a global roadmap uh, for payments for making uh, traditional cross-border payments uh, faster cheaper uh, and more inclusive. We set ourselves uh, concrete targets for 2027 um, so that we very much see the old world and the new world, uh, let me say, coexist. And then ultimately, it is up to the customers to decide uh, how they want to carry out their, uh, their payments. So I, mean, I understand that, but we, one has to prioritize. There are some things that we know are happening, climate change. And this one seems a little bit more speculative, but you said, and you caught my ear, that there are some countries where this is already macro significant. So can you be a little more specific? What kind of countries and in what way? Yeah, absolutely. So um, there are some emerging markets. I don't want to name names now, but Just give where... the first letter. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I will refrain <laughs> from that, but uh, I can write down the name here. Um, so uh, there are some countries um, where uh, crypto activity is very high. So we actually have a table in, in our Global Financial Stability Report, you know, just uh, looking at publicly available data. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, you, you see a certain number of, of emerging markets. Think of major emerging markets with high inflation and weak institutions, um, you know, where uh, the public, uh, you know, prefers mm -hmm. uh, crypto assets um, to the domestic currency, right? And, and, and there are good reasons for that, right? Because, uh, uh, you know, the domestic currency is, is depreciating very, very quickly. Um, and, you know, using dollars is one way, but, you know, electronic money is, uh, is, is oftentimes... Uh, uh, easier uh, to use. And um, uh, my understanding is that um, so-called stable coins, um, typically denominated in, in, in US dollars, is, is uh, quite widespread. Mm. Um, now, uh, so that is uh, the cryptoization uh, issue. There's the whole criminal activity and, and you know, undermining uh, 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 tax uh, and, and, and capital flow measures. Um, you know, we don't know how big that uh, that is, um, but um, I would I would I, I just wanted to to react to to what Klaas said, um, and I would I would twist it a little bit. So I do think we have seen three distinct technological innovations um, that are driving uh, this uh, this change that we are we are seeing right now. So one is encryption, right? Encryption as a, as, as a technology is extremely powerful and can be used in lots of different ways. So, so cryptos use encryption in a particular way, but it can be used in all kinds of ways. I mean, you know, our cell phones and, and iPads are using encryption in many, many different ways, but it's extremely powerful. Uh, secondly, tokenization, right? So tokenization, I already alluded to that, is not per se a technological uh, concept, it, 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 it's linked to a legal concept, uh, but I would just, um, you know, think of tokenization as referring to 
an entry on a ledger. And this can be a common ledger or a distributed ledger. And so when it's, a, when it's distributed, this is typically crypto. But when it's a common ledger, it's more like a, a traditional payment system. And then thirdly, there's programmability, right? So programmability, not of money, but uh, applications that are using money in a programmable fashion is uh, potentially uh, very powerful. And so I think, um, you know, we see a lot of innovation going on because there are new technologies. But how this is going to impact the financial system is not only determined by technology, it's also determined by yes. policy, right? And one of the key uh, developments uh, this year in collaboration between the IMF and the FSB was, uh, you know, to come out with a policy framework that does aim at reaping the benefits from these new technologies by generating policy frameworks that are appropriately balancing the potential benefits with while minimizing the costs. Right? And the benefits being more efficient, lower cost, more reliable record keeping, the painting is on the blockchain and everybody. Exactly, along. exactly, exactly. So you could have said, we want a global ban. And the, the, the decision was not to go for a global bank, but to go for a policy framework in order to reap the benefits. And just to, to finish this line of thought, you know, we do see a number of countries where innovation is done, where you know, central bank digital currency is using some of these technological innovations with an aim to achieve policy objectives, right? So crypto, when you think back of the history of crypto, was generated to sort of like undermine governments and being remote from governments. But of course, you can use the technology in another right. configuration with policy goals. So CBDC can borrow some of these technologies with policy goals. Um, there's also a push to tokenize bank deposits. And at that point, you are squarely in money. So CBDC is all like M0 tokenized, but you can also tokenize M1. Um, and you can tokenize um, money market fund shares potentially, right? So tokenization is, is a second very powerful idea. And then this programmability idea uh, is also being explored in, in, in various fashions. So, so I would think that um, there's an interplay in between policy uh, and technological innovation uh, that, that with, the, with the end goal of making the system safe and stable, but also cheaper and more inclusive, right? So financial inclusion is really you know, one of the main uh, uh, hopes uh, of, this, of this journey. Um, thank you. If you, if you want to respond to that, go ahead. But Klaus, I wanted you could expand a little bit on the uh, helping emerging and developing economies cope with something that, gosh, it's hard enough for advanced economies to cope with. What specifically can the FSB, the IMF, do to help them so they don't end up being the victims of uh, the financial instability consequences of, of you know, synthetic dollars, uh, cryptoization? Well, that's a very important question, uh, David, because uh, as, uh, as Tobias was already alluding to, uh, uh, many or at least some EMDs already face uh, heightened financial stability risk as a result of the emergence of, uh, of, of crypto assets. Uh, that's often due to a combination of somewhat weaker uh, monetary frameworks and then the fact that they also face qui uh, quite some challenges in, let's say, the traditional uh, cross-border payments. And the combination of the two then leads to a higher susceptibility, I would say, to currency substitution uh, risk. And that is usually also be, being perceived by these EMDs as a sort of a foreign stable coin uh, taking over uh, monetary sovereignty in the country at question that they cannot do anything about. And that's why uh, the natural reflex of some of these countries has been, OK, let's have a ban, let's try to have a global ban, etc. Now, as, as Tobias pointed out, I don't think a ban is desirable uh, for the fact, simple fact that we never know which technology will bring uh, the greater benefits going into the future. May I remind this audience that in the early 1990s, there were also serious people uh, uh, suggesting that we should ban the Internet. I'm quite grateful that we didn't go there. 
Um, and also in this crypto world, by the way, even if you were to agree on the desirability of a ban, how would you do it in a world where you can just take a server under your arm, put it anywhere and start issuing these uh, crypto assets? So instead of going uh, this easy, but I think, uh, or conceptually easy, but in practice, implement, uh, unimplementable road of, of banning crypto, what we have said is, okay, let's try to build a comprehensive global regulatory framework. And within that framework, pay a little bit additional attention to this EMD issue and sort of listen what are, to them, what are their specific needs in this regard? Well, most of these needs have to do with information exchange. Most of them eh, want to have a, a sort of a, a free flow of information with jurisdictions in the country where the stable coin is actually coming from, which eh, can become a threat to monetary uh, sovereignty uh, in, in the country. So we will uh, come, come forward together with the standard setting body with enhanced requirements on sort of information exchange, supervisory cooperation uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the like. And for all of that, of course, we first need data, right? I mean, in order to monitor sort of the activity of stable coins uh, in your jurisdiction, you need the right uh, data. And so that's why I come back to my point that this all starts with having good data, good data on interrelations with traditional finance, but definitely also good data on cross-border uh, application of these uh, crypto asset technologies. Well, thank you for reminding me that this is a data forum. Um, which brings <laughs> me to a question I want to ask you, Tobias. So you've been in this business a long time, and can you talk a little bit about the practical and institutional difficulties in getting data outside of the traditional banking system? Uh, we learned during the global financial crisis that there was a whole lot of threats to financial stability in parts of the financial system that we knew very much nothing about. Um, and so how, what kind of progress have we made on that front and what lessons have we learned there that are applicable to this? <clears throat> that, that is a challenging uh, question. Um, you know, the G20 Data Gap Initiative was created after the 2008 crisis. I think it was in, in 2009. Um, and uh, it was led by the IMF, FSB, and um, uh, I think BIS. Um, and, you know, I do think we have made progress um, uh, to some degree uh, on uh, non-bank financial intermediation. So, for example, for uh, many segments uh, in, uh, in, in um, you know, asset management, like um, in mutual funds, open-ended funds, exchange-traded funds, money market funds, we do have very good data and it's very broad uh, across the world. Uh, but there are other markets where we haven't made as much progress. So for example, in private loan markets, private credit markets, private equity, there's very little data. There's some differentiation across jurisdictions, but, but generally uh, we don't have as much data there. Uh, for hedge funds, you know, I think in Europe uh, there's uh, much better data collection than uh, elsewhere. Um, but uh, I think uh, there, there, there remain some holes um, and, um, you know, for crypto certainly we are sort of like at, at, at uh, 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 square zero. Um, so, uh, and I, I think there are two challenges, right? So the reason that we have very good banking data is that uh, there's a carrot and a stick with the banks, right? So uh, banks um, so like are uh, more or less happy <laughs> uh, to be regulated and also to provide data because they are getting backstops, right? Uh, they are inside the safety net. Um, and so there's a carrot as well as uh, the stick of regulation and, 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 and data reporting, et cetera. Uh, but for non-banks, we typically don't have that, and, and, and certainly for, for crypto, we don't have that, right? I mean, uh, you know, non-banks, you know, sometimes there are some facilities that allow uh, non-banks uh, to borrow uh, or, or to give collateral, but it's only in severe crisis circumstances. Uh, so that, I think, is one challenge. Um, the second uh, challenge is the geographical spread, right? Um, so... Um, 
you know, the, uh, uh, think about the FSB membership, right? The FSB membership has 80 or 90% of all uh, uh, financial uh, activity in the world. Um, but there are many smaller jurisdictions uh, that are members of the IMF, uh, but not uh, of, of the uh, G20 or, or FSB, uh, where important uh, financial uh, uh, transactions take place. Um, you know, FTX is, is one example that comes to mind here. Um, and so some, some 25 years ago, there was actually an initiative at the IMF uh, where the board of the IMF asked us to do uh, more granular assessments of uh, financial, um, uh, uh, you know, countries with, you know, smaller um, uh, financial uh, sectors. Um, and, you know, that was later on folded into the FSUPs. But I think with the crypto um, uh, becoming, you know, more important for, for statistics, um, you know, using the breadth of the IMF membership, um, the obligation of members to be part of IMF surveillance, right? So every, every country has to be subjected to uh, uh, surveillance to be a good member. And our ability to ask authorities for data, right? These are pretty powerful tools where I think the IMF can be very much complementary uh, to the efforts by the FSB. <coughs> the Articles of Agreement are extremely powerful in these dimensions, and I think that can be extremely helpful in terms of not only rolling out the regulations broadly around the world, but also in terms of ultimately getting data um, and understanding what's going on you know, in, 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 in the broad membership. Mm. So, Klaus, could you talk a little bit about for your own, per speaking for yourself and not all the institutions you represent, about how you think about the pros and cons of central bank digital currency? Oh, well, yes. Um, I mean, of course, when I think about central bank digital currency, I have to make clear that this indeed is not a financial stability board issue. Right. Uh, we, uh, I mean, we focus on the private side of crypto and central bank digital currency is a matter uh, <laughs> for central banks. So, as I am also a central banker and as I am part of the euro system where we are working also on uh, on the digital euro. So I think um, uh, one reason to think about the digital euro is that uh, in the past payment systems have always had a, a balance between, let's say, public money and private money, where the public money that was the money where the public had direct, direct access to the central bank balance sheet. And the public money in the old days used to be uh, old-fashioned cash, so notes and coins. Now, in many, many countries, and, and the Netherlands is actually a forerunner in this uh, regard, cash is, well, maybe not on the way out, but it's clearly and very, very strongly on the retreat. Uh, cash is something that in my country is only or almost only used by, uh, let's say, the elderly who have difficulty in common to grips with digital uh, innovations, etc. But if you look at the younger generation, they have never seen a banknote in their life anymore. Um, and so cash is on, on the way down uh, very, very quickly. Now, if we don't replace or compensate that development with the central bank digital currency, then we're slowly morphing into a situation where we would only have private money. And that is not in line with the preferences of a significant part of the Dutch population who also want to have a public payments alternative to, let's say, a private payment, uh, payment products. So for me, uh, the central bank digital currency, first and foremost, is simply uh, a banknote in a digital fashion. Uh, it's there to compensate for the decline in the usage uh, of cash. And does central bank digital currencies pose threats of disintermediation to the commercial banking system? Um, yeah, that, that is, uh, uh, you know, one question that uh, many central banks around the world are struggling with, right? Um, over 100 countries in the world uh, have central banks that are exploring central bank digital currencies. Uh, in fact, we just launched a handbook on central bank digital currency. We have five chapters at the moment. We're aiming to have 20 chapters on CBDC that is really so like a, a guide for central banks how to think through 
uh, this journey. So we're not telling central banks what to do. We're helping them thinking through the trade-offs and thinking through design issues. Um, as, as Klaas already mentioned, this is all about you know, solving economic problems. And uh, so, um, you know, making sure that uh, CBDC is not undermining uh, uh, banking intermediation uh, is uh, really intimately tied to the design of the CBDC. Um, in our view, uh, you know, CBDC can be very useful even if it's very small. Um, and, uh, you know, that is because it's a backstop, um, it provides trust, right? So. Uh, if you have uh, a financial system where the only money liabilities are privately issued liabilities, uh, at some point you can lose uh, the routing of the monetary system in the central bank. And so this is, I think, where the most uh, important argument is for CBDC. But of course, it would a priori be unremunerated. Most countries uh, envision some sort of limits. And so that is all designed in order to limit any, any form of um, uh, disintermediation. So I think we, should, we have time for a few questions, if you have any. If not, I have a long list. Yeah, please, come to the mic and identify yourselves. Maybe we'll take two or three and then let Klaus in. From the statistics department of the IMF. Uh, Tobias, you mentioned the handbook on CBDCs. And I would like to talk about uh, what I call low-hanging fruit. And uh, uh, down the road, in a few years, we may have CBDCs issued by countries or economies uh, like <laughs> the European Union, the European Monetary Union, with reserve status. So very highly demanded and, and stable currencies. I would like to talk about fast digital dollarization in vulnerable countries and how the IMF is advising how to deal with this problem. The problem, as you know well, has been, is what happens if the population, because of the weak currency, the depreciation, hyperinflation, is the population with the more knowledge and better means can switch from local currency to a, a, a CBDC issued by the euro, or renminbi, or that's a big problem that cannot be solved from the statistical point of view from the local statistician. Right. Uh, especially if these people are using apps and are using uh, wallets or custodians that are outside the country, that could be a possibility. Yep. So again, it's not about crypto. I mean, for me, the main threat to uh, to this problem of substitution, of uh, digital substitution, sure. is, is CBDCs. Right. So, good, very good question. I mean, we learned at Silicon Valley Bank that when you can move your money quickly, it turns out people do. Is there another question? Yes, sir. Okay, so my question is related to actually your first question to the panelists uh, and is uh, related to reasons for regulation. So we've been uh, during these two days uh, that the uh, uh, market uh, share of, of cryptos for the time being is very tiny if you compare with uh, global financial flows. So I think uh, there were very good answers given uh, about, uh, you know, the risks of this uh, could be growing in the future and also concentration in emerging economies, uh, which might be a threat. Uh, but my question is which kind of message uh, is given if financial authorities start regulating cryptos? Uh, so we have uh, more or less uh, come to the conclusion that these are not financial assets. And therefore, uh, uh, aren't we sending a message uh, to uh, the layman uh, investor by regulating these, these assets uh, that they are legit uh, investments? Is this not uh, an important risk that we should also take into account? And I'm saying this because also, uh, historically, uh, most of the bubbles, uh, like uh, tulips uh, or, or even stamps, uh, started like this and were never subject to regulation by financial authorities. Right. You mean you think they're you. conferring legitimacy on them by regulating them? All right, why don't we start with those? Do you want to take the second question, Klaus, and then we'll let... Um... Yeah. <clears throat> Did you yeah, hear please. it? No, I, I think... I mean, uh, of course, we have to come to an assessment whether these uh, such activities can pose a threat of financial stability, a serious threat to financial stability. Now, 
since we have been began to uh, uh, since we began to monitor uh, the crypto asset activity, we've always looked at sort of size. We looked at the volatility, and we looked at the potential of volatility in crypto markets to spill over to traditional finance. <laughs> the moment that we started to conclude that hey, there is actually a case for uh, regulation is when on all these three dimensions we saw a very rapid, if not an exponential, uh, growth. So it was not just the size and the volatility of crypto markets itself, because if that was the only case, then you could say, okay, let crypto burn. Huh? It's an it's a ecosystem of itself. If people want to go to casinos, we also don't prohibit them from going to casinos, don't we? But the fact of the matter is that there is also a lot of institutional and retail interest in crypto assets and the interlinkages with the traditional financial system, they, they are also very rapidly on the increase. And that is actually the main reason eh, why at some point we, we strongly feel that we, have to, uh, that, we, that we have to regulate the crypto. That is also one reason why I believe that let, let crypto burn is simply not going to work. There is too much interest, as I said, uh, also from institutional part, uh, parties, from retail parties. So crypto will be there. We just have to make sure that it doesn't pose uh, financial stability risk. And for that, the interconnections, managing the interconnections with the traditional financial system is very important. That's, of course, not only realized through the requirements that we put out on crypto asset activities on the stablecoin. There's also separate banking regulation eh, that looks at the exposures of banks into crypto assets as a sort of asset category uh, for, for the banks. But that is the reason why we do strongly feel that regulation is appropriate here. And do you want to talk about instant dollarization? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, um, you know, the problem that you're alluding to is already uh, there with, with stable coins. Um, uh, you know, I mean, CBDCs may or may not be available outside of, of the country's borders, right? So. Uh, the the sand dollar in Bahamas, for example, is not you cannot use it outside of the uh, of the of the country, um, and so that that is a decision that uh, countries have to take. I mean, at the moment, uh, I think the digital yuan is not is not available outside of China, right? Uh, but uh, in principle, countries could make it available uh, broadly. Uh, I think the the threat at the moment is more uh, with uh, stable coins. Uh, you know, which are uh, uh, being used uh, in countries. Uh, and this is why uh, uh, some of this uh, work uh, is on, on, on capital controls, right? At the moment, you know, so like your, 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 your short-term solution uh, to stem capital outflows is via, you know, very uh, intrusive measures, which are capital controls and, and conversion limits and, you know, uh, 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 surrender requirements, etc. So you know that that is uh, sort of like the the short term solution. The long term solution is, of course, to uh, build uh, stable institutions. And uh, you know, alongside the statistics department, uh, the the monetary and capital markets department spends a huge amount of resources on capacity building, right? On uh, implementing these regulatory frameworks. Uh, uh, in uh, on on you know regulating uh, both banks and, and non banks, but also building capacity in central banks, etc. So now, building capacity is a long term project, right? It's it, there are no quick wins in the in the short term. You know, intrusive measures such as capital controls are basically the only only way. And uh, you know, in principle, conceptually, you can have. Uh, uh, wallets, um, you know, that are uh, providing uh, capital controls and that are sending all that data to the statistical office, right? Conceptually, that's possible. Uh, to get it done in practice, of course, uh, is is difficult, but that is part of of the regulatory push, right? And so, you know, just to to complement one more thing that uh, uh, that that class was explaining, and it's really the crypto. Uh, asset service providers that are subject to the regulation. Again, I mean, Bitcoin in and of itself cannot be regulated, right? It's just, it's just uh, you know, uh, but uh, the service providers can, and the service providers in principle would then uh, have a requirement to impose those capital controls and, and, and send that data to, to BERT. <laughs> we'll keep it all in this digital wallet. Um, 
Uh, I don't see any other questions. If I think there was another question. Oh, yes, question. please. Yeah. Is there any thinking about the impact of quantum computers on these things? Quantum the, computers. The next, yeah. yeah, the next level. Yeah, or AI for that matter. Yeah, so um, it is, uh, you know, AI, absolutely. So it's both, it's a combination of AI and quantum that I think uh, is, is a major, major threat uh, to financial stability, uh, enforcement of anything, right? I mean, AI and quantum computing can be used for good and can, it can be used for evil. And I think it is, it is a major, major threat. Uh, we're certainly doing work on that. Uh, but I think it's going to be a, a major challenge. Um, so, you know, and what I, thought, what I said earlier about encryption is potentially undermined, but not just for crypto or CBDCs, but for the entire financial system, any, any statistics office, you know, can, can potentially be hacked, right? I mean, it is a major okay, threat stop before we all to everything. So, yeah, hard. sorry. <laughs> and, yeah. and if I may, uh, if I may, David, just, just to add to this, it's of course a major development also to the extent that it has the potential of adding, uh, let's say, additional forms of interconnectedness in the financial system uh, that would not have been there uh, uh, without the, this technology. So it's not only a matter of the capacity to scale up faster, bigger, et cetera, but if you think it through, uh, also the, the, the nature of the interconnectedness in the financial system will be, uh, will be uh, under influence, will be influenced by this development. And that is, of course, yeah, that's the mother of where uh, most of the financial uh, stability risk uh, is, is where the systemic risk is coming from. Right. I mean, I think you mentioned the pro programmable contracts. You can imagine a self-fulfilling panic because everybody wrote the same thing into their programmable contracts and it's all executing and there's no circuit breaker. So, Absolutely. okay. So, um, Bert, you want to close us, but it has to be somewhat hopeful and encouraging. <laughs> I'll try. So thanks, class. Thanks, Tobias. Thanks, David, for this um, great um, discussion. I think it's very fitting, uh, the future of money, uh, an overview, a flying overview, but also very concrete. Um, the risks, the opportunities, policy, regulations, and what I understood as a call for all regulators to put data provisions in the regulatory things to send data to statistics so we can do our job. Um, we statisticians like to uh, do things that are relevant, uh, things that really matter, that really help policymakers. And it's very clear from both your discussions, but also the rest of this forum, there's a big need for data about these new issues. And we really like to take up that challenge and live up to that challenge. And we is not we alone. We is us in cooperation, uh, policy um, people, regulatory people, institutions, international, national, academia, private world, if we do it together, we can really try to get this information base that we all need. So um, we are at the conclusion of um, the Statistical Forum. These were two very remarkable days, um, full of thought-provoking presentations and engaging discussions. Um, we were having, on average, 300 participants, and um, virtual and in person, and the opening session yesterday was live streamed by 200 people, 2,000 people watched it. This session is live streamed too, and I haven't heard how many people see it, but it's clear that there's a large interest. There are participants from international organizations, academia, national authorities, private sectors, and we explored the new forms of payments, um, which are of topics of significant interest worldwide. Right. I'd like to start thanking you all for your active participations, for your contributions. Without you, this would not have been the forum that we had. So some key takeaways. Um, we talked about the emerging digital payment methods. Um, and I'm going to repeat what Klaas and Tobias just said. This was a, a great overview. But we talked about um, digital payment methods like electronic money, uh, central bank digital currencies, digital tokens, crypto assets, all following a fascinated overview of the, on the history of money, tracing its roots back to the Mesopotamian accounting tokens. And look where we came from there. We assessed moneyness of each innovation, um, the CBDCs as digital equivalents of central bank currency, 
represent a modern counterpart to traditional central bank notes and coins, as Klaas just said. And we discussed um, crypto assets a lot. We got a glimpse of uh, crypto holdings in uh, the United States just before um, this, um, this panel discussion, um, but also interesting insights from Brazil and how you measure the uh, FX, um, interfe FX um, uh, way to, to, to get these um, cryptos. And we also um, discussed and were very clear the uh, fundamental characteristics of money that do not apply to cryptos and which also aligns with the view of um, our statistics department. Um, a lot of opportunities and risks were mentioned. Um, the potential benefits of emerging payment methods were mentioned like um, uh, potential faster and more efficient cross-border payments, financial inclusion, but we also heard about risks of these emerging technologies. Um, as central banks roll out digital versions of these currencies, our central bank panelists these two days discussed their strategies for addressing concerns, particularly the risk of disintermediation within the banking sectors. And of course, the risk stemming from crypto assets got a lot of attention. Um, I want to mention here issues like money laundering and various criminal activities, funding illicit actions that got attention in this forum, potential harm to consumer protection. And also in uh, the panel with Klaas and Tobias, uh, we talked about the numerous macrofinancial implications of crypto assets, including a significant potential reduction in the effectiveness of capital flow management due to cross-border crypto flows. Many underscored the pressing need for policymakers to adapt their regulatory framework to strike a balance between mitigating the risks associated with crypto assets and fostering innovation. Well, a lot of progress has been made, as been said in this panel, in laying the groundwork for robust crypto assets policy, a regulatory framework, and again, data provisions should be part of that. So, coming to data, um, the need for more robust and standardized data emerged through these two days as a central and recurring topic across the sessions of this forum. Data are needed to enhance policy formulation and provide insights into adoption patterns, usage, and their broader implications. So who holds these assets, who transacts these assets, in which countries, what are the sectors? We heard again and again the need to share data across institutions and borders, whether it's for CBDCs or crypto assets, while at the same time preserving the privacy of personal information. And this is difficult from legal perspective and privacy perspective, but I think we need to find solutions to be able to deliver the results that are asked from us. Dependent on data gaps, acknowledge the challenges for crypto assets, including the decentralized and pseudo-anonymous nature of crypto assets and the absence of data reporting requirements. The importance of non-traditional commercial data to fill the data gaps currently was stressed a lot. And Tobias and Klaas, we, we hear the need for crypto asset data for policymakers, regulators, as they navigate this uncharted territory, and we take that very seriously. Efforts are being made to facilitate international cooperation to address the data needs. Um, the D20 Data Gaps Initiative that was mentioned a lot these two days um, has recommendations and is leading the efforts with D20 economists to put together a data framework for CBDCs and crypto assets, and this is great joint work. And we heard from the panel yesterday that BIS, along with its partners, has several initiatives, including Project Atlas, a data platform to shed light on the macroeconomic relevance of crypto asset markets and decentralized finance. So what's next? I guess get to work. We are committed to help to pursue all this, all the demands. STA, in cooperation with other international organizations like the FSB, BIS, ECB, Eurostat, uh, many others, is working to ensure there's a well-defined, relevant, and international comparable data for economists and policymakers. And this is a real cooperative effort, and that's also very challenging, but also very exciting to do. Statistics are not something you just do in your own room, in your own department. We have to reach out, work together, and that makes our life even more interesting. We're very eager to apply the insights gained from this forum, also the network that has been built during this forum. It's a critical input into to the department's mandate to produce macro accounting standards that are implementable. So not only useful, but also implementable. It should also be able to compile them. 
Well, the timing is very useful. Uh, as many as you know, we're currently leading the effort to update the system of national accounts and the balance of payments manual, both due for release in 2025. The updated BPM and SNA will guide our member countries in recording new types of digital financial assets and transactions that have been emerged in recent years. After that, we will do the update of the GFS, the SIA, but also of the monetary finance statistics um, manual and compliance guides. We will launch that next year, the update process, and it will build on the SNA and the BPM to expand the guidance on measuring money and liquidity aggregates. Our work today will shape the data of tomorrow and ensure that data-driven policies keep our financial system resilient and accessible to all. And I think this year's statistical forum has contributed to that. Coming to a close, also next year we'll have a statistical forum. Um, we'll invite you all to think what the topic of that forum should be. There's a QR code that will appear on the screen <laughs> and the TV screens, and if you look at that and uh, you come into a poll and then your opinion is asked what we should have a forum on next year. Well, there's the QR code. So then some acknowledgements. Um, I'd like to thank you all again. This forum uh, wouldn't be a good forum if you would not have attended, if you would not have interacted with us, give your questions, your opinions, your views. I would like to thank the presenters the panelists, the moderators, uh, for their pivotal roles in making this forum an uh, enriching experience. I'd also like to thank the STA organizational team. Um, so much work has gone on behind the scenes. Uh, people have been working for six months. Uh, the main organizing team with uh, Jim, Padma and Jennifer, but so many people behind the scenes. I mean, many of them are sitting behind the table. I want to thank you all. We have a happy hour after this uh, forum. You did a great job and I'm very thankful for everything you did to make this a success. I wanted to list the names, but it's so long that I'll do it at the happy hour. So many people contributed. But I'd also like to thank Tobias and his team in MCM. Um, we're the statistics department in, in the IMF for a reason. We're here because we want to make data that really helps, that really matter. And you and your team have been so instrumental in ensuring that the use of data and the policy relevance is central to this forum. And not only this forum, during the whole work at the IMF that we're doing together. So thank you for that. And also the valuable support from um, creative services and event staff, the caterers, our communication departments. I mean, this forum is really a collaborative effort to make it successful. Last thing I want to say here is thank you all. Safe travels back. This meeting is no longer being recorded.